following is a presentation by the Texas Association of Realtors. This presentation provides a brief overview of the TAR residential lease, which is TAR form number 2001. As you watch this video, keep in mind that this presentation does not cover every aspect of the lease. Remember to read through the entire lease thoroughly because the lease becomes a binding contract when signed by all parties. Also, it is important to point out that this presentation is not intended as a substitute for consulting with an attorney. We will now begin the presentation by discussing each paragraph. Paragraph 1, Parties. This paragraph identifies all parties to the lease, including the landlord and tenant. Remember that the landlord is the owner, lesser, and sublesser of the property. Property managers or property management companies should not be listed as the landlord. If there are multiple tenants, confirm that all tenants are identified in this paragraph. Make sure your names are spelled correctly. Paragraph 2, Property. This paragraph identifies the real property leased to the tenant. It contains the physical address and the legal description as well as the county where the property is located. It also identifies any non-real property items that may be included such as refrigerators, washers, dryers, personal items, and the like. Paragraph 3, Term. This paragraph contains the term of the lease. It provides the commencement date and the date the initial term expires. Please remember that the lease does not automatically end on the expiration date. It also requires the tenant to occupy the property by the fifth day of the lease. If the tenant is unable to occupy the property by the fifth day due to construction on the property or the prior tenant's holding over, this paragraph explains their right to terminate the lease. This right does not apply to a delay caused by cleaning, repairs, or make-ready items. Paragraph 4, Automatic Renewal and Notice of Termination. This paragraph explains the renewal and termination process. The lease will automatically renew on a month-to-month -month basis unless either party provides written notice to the other within the number of days selected in paragraph 4A. If the number of days is not selected, at least 30 days notice is required. The notice requirement must be strictly followed. If either party does not give the required notice provided in the lease, it will automatically continue on a month-to-month -month basis. If the lease does automatically renew on a month-to-month -month basis, it will continue on a month-to-month -month basis until either party provides written notice to the other. The termination date of the month-to-month -month provision will depend on the date selected in paragraph 4B. It is important to note that any notice of termination must be in writing. Do not give oral notification because it will not be sufficient under any circumstance. Keep in mind that the date on which rent is due does not apply to the requirement for providing written notice of termination. Paragraph 5, Rent. This paragraph identifies the monthly rent the date rent is due, the place of payment, and the method of payment. Rent is due on the day provided in the lease, even if that day falls on a weekend or holiday. A delay in the mail will not excuse the tenant's obligation to pay rent on time. Remember that strict compliance with the due date is required. This paragraph also identifies to whom payment should be made and the place of payment. Rent should be paid by the type of funds selected in the lease, which include cashier's check, electronic payment, money order, personal check, or other forms acceptable to the landlord. The tenant should not pay the rent in cash unless otherwise agreed. Finally, this paragraph explains that there will be no rent increases through the primary term of the lease, but rent increases are permitted during any month-to-month -month renewal period as long as the landlord provides the tenant with at least 30 days written notice. Paragraph 6, Late Charges. This paragraph identifies the date rent is considered late and the initial amount to be assessed for each late payment. Additional late charges can be added each day until the rent and late charges are paid in full. It is important for the tenant to pay the rent on time to avoid these charges. The Texas Property Code prohibits a landlord from assessing a late fee until the rent has remained unpaid for at least one full day after the due date. For example, if the rent is due on the first of the month, the landlord may not impose late charges until the third of the month. If the tenant mails the rent payment, it is important to note that the postmark date is not the date the landlord receives the payment. 
the only date that matters is the date the landlord actually receives the rent. Also, the landlord's acceptance of a late charge does not waive his right to exercise remedies provided in the lease. Paragraph 7, Return Payment. This paragraph provides that the amount charged for each returned or dishonored payment. If the tenant payment is returned for any reason, the tenant is required to make the payment good by paying the returned amount plus return payment charges and any late charges. These charges must be paid in certified funds. Paragraph 8, Application of Funds. This paragraph explains that the landlord may apply any funds received from the tenant to any non-rent obligations before applying the funds to the rent. Non-rent obligations include late charges, returned payment charges, repairs, brokerage fees, periodic utilities, and pet charges. This applies even if the tenant makes a notation on the payment to apply the funds first to the rent. Paragraph 9, Pets. This paragraph explains that pets are generally not allowed on the property, and it further explains that the actions the landlord may exercise if the tenant violates this paragraph by having unauthorized pets. If the landlord does agree to allow pets on the property, the tenant may be subject to additional fees. Both parties will also be required to sign a pet agreement. The pet agreement is TAR Form 2004 and becomes an addendum to the lease, not a replacement of this paragraph. Even if there is a signed pet agreement, this paragraph still applies to the lease for any pets not on the pet agreement. Paragraph 10, Security Deposit. This paragraph provides the amount of security deposit, the due date, and the method of payment. The security deposit is due on or before the date the lease is signed by all parties. The paragraph also provides notice that the Texas Property Code prohibits a tenant from withholding payment of any portion of the last month's rent on grounds that the security deposit is security for unpaid rent and the penalties for doing this are substantial. Before the landlord is obligated to return or account for the security deposit, the tenant must give the landlord at least 30 days written notice of surrendering the property. The landlord is not obligated to return or account for the security deposit until the tenant has surrendered the property and has provided their forwarding address in writing. Once the tenant has done so, the landlord has 30 days to return or account for the security deposit. This paragraph also provides notice to the tenant that any interest or income earned on the security deposit will be paid to the landlord or his representative. Finally, this paragraph lists the charges the landlord may deduct from the security deposit. If the deductions exceed the security deposit, the tenant is obligated to pay the landlord the excess within 10 days of the landlord's written demand. Paragraph 11, Utilities. This paragraph explains that the tenant is responsible for all utility fees and costs to the property unless the lease states otherwise. This paragraph also lists the utilities that the tenant must keep on at all times if they are available. Before signing the lease, the tenant should determine if these utilities are available to the property and are adequate for their use. Paragraph 12, Use and Occupancy. This paragraph covers the permitted use of the property and the persons permitted to reside on the property. The tenant may use the property only as a private residence. All other uses are prohibited. The tenant must disclose the names and ages of all occupants that will be permitted to reside on the property during the term of the lease. This paragraph also requires the tenant to promptly notify the landlord of any changes in their contact information. If there is a homeowners association, the tenant should become familiar with the association rules because the tenant will be subject to those rules. If the tenant has guests, check the lease for the amount of time a guest is permitted to stay on the property. Finally, the paragraph provides a list of activities that are prohibited. Be sure to read through those and refrain from engaging in those activities. Paragraph 13, Parking Rules. This paragraph limits the number of vehicles the tenant is permitted to have on the property. It further restricts the parking areas where the tenant may park. The tenant may not store any vehicles on the property or on the street in front of the property. If the tenant fails to comply with this paragraph, the landlord may have the vehicle towed at the tenant's own expense. Paragraph 14, Access by Landlord. 
This paragraph authorizes the landlord or anyone authorized by the landlord to access the property. The landlord or his agent will first attempt to contact the tenant, but they are permitted to enter the property at reasonable times without notice to make repairs or to show the property. Additionally, the landlord or his agent may enter the property without giving notice in limited circumstances provided in the lease. Be sure to read through those limited situations. It is important to note that if the landlord or his agent has made arrangements with the tenant to access the property, the tenant may incur a trip charge if they prevent such access. This paragraph also authorizes a key box to be placed on the property. Tenants may withdraw this authorization by providing written notice and paying a fee to the landlord. Paragraph 15, move-in condition. This paragraph explains that the tenant will complete the inventory and condition form within the number of days indicated. The landlord or his representative will provide the tenant with this form. If the tenant fails to deliver the form within the required time to the property will be deemed to be free of damages. It is important to note that the inventory and condition form is not a request for repairs. Repairs will be discussed later in this presentation. Paragraph 16, move out. This paragraph requires the tenant to surrender the property in the same condition as when the tenant moved in, with the exception of normal wear and tear. The tenant must leave the property in a clean condition, free of all trash, debris, and any personal property. The tenant may not abandon the property. This paragraph also defines the terms normal wear and tear, surrender, and abandonment. In the event that the tenant leaves behind personal property, the landlord may dispose of, give away, or store and sell the personal property. In addition, the tenant is obligated to reimburse the landlord for all reasonable costs for packing, removing, storing, and selling the personal property left in the property. Paragraph 17, Property Maintenance. This paragraph explains the tenant's responsibilities in maintaining the property. Maintenance of the property will extend to yard maintenance and to pool or spa maintenance, if there is a pool or spa. Be sure to take a look at the list of responsibilities that the tenant must perform and whether they are responsible for paying for the maintenance. The specific responsibilities for any pool or spa are covered in a separate addendum, which is TAR Form 2010. The tenant is also prohibited from altering the property unless they obtain written consent from the landlord. It is important to note that the tenant, if the tenant fails to maintain the property as required under this paragraph, the landlord may perform these activities, but the tenant will be required to reimburse the landlord for reasonable expenses. Other remedies the landlord may exercise will be discussed in paragraph 27. Finally, this paragraph indicates whether smoking is permitted on the property. If smoking is not allowed but does occur on the property, the landlord is entitled to certain remedies discussed in this paragraph. Paragraph 18, Repairs. This paragraph addresses repair obligations for both the landlord and tenant. All requests for repairs must be in writing. Keep in mind that if the tenant is delinquent in rent at the time they provide this written request, the landlord is not obligated to make the repair. That is why it is important to stay current on the rent. This paragraph also provides a number to call in the event of an emergency related to the property. If the landlord fails to repair a condition that materially affects the physical health or safety of an ordinary tenant, be sure to review this paragraph as it provides a list of remedies a tenant may exercise. The property code presumes seven days is a reasonable time for the landlord to make a diligent effort to repair a condition. This is subject to the availability of materials, labor, and utilities. Finally, this paragraph lists the repairs the landlord will pay the cost to repair and rich repairs the tenant will pay the cost of. The landlord may require advance payment of repairs for which the tenant is responsible for paying. The tenant may not repair any condition without the landlord's permission. The landlord has sole discretion regarding all decisions regarding repairs. If a repair person is unable to access the property after making arrangements with the tenant to complete a repair, the tenant is responsible for paying any trip charge the repair person may charge. Paragraph 19, Security Devices and Exterior Locks.
This paragraph indicates that the property must be equipped with certain security devices required by law. These requirements can be found in subchapter D, chapter 92 of the Texas Property Code. There are various remedies for the tenant if the landlord fails to comply with the Texas Property Code. Also, there are substantial penalties for the landlord if these security devices are not installed. The landlord is required to rekey the security devices within seven days after the tenant moves into the property. Any request to rekey, change, install, repair, or replace a security device must be in writing. Requests for additional security devices or additional rekeying will be paid by the tenant in advance and may be installed only by contractors authorized by the landlord. Paragraph 20, Smoke Alarms. This paragraph indicates that the property must be equipped with smoke alarms in certain areas of the property. If the tenant requests additional installation, inspection, or repair, it must be in writing. If the tenant disconnects or intentionally damages a smoke alarm or removes a battery without replacing it with a working battery, they may be subject to liability. Be sure to review Subchapter F, Chapter 92 of the Texas Property Code for these requirements. Paragraph 21, Liability. This paragraph explains that the landlord is not responsible to the tenant, the tenant's guest, family, or occupants for any damages, injuries, or losses to a person or property caused by the specific conditions or events listed in this paragraph, unless the conditions or events were caused by the landlord. If the tenant, the tenant's guests, family, occupants, or pets caused any loss or damage to the property, the tenant must promptly reimburse the landlord for those costs. Paragraph 22, Holdover. This paragraph explains that if the tenant does not vacate at the time the lease or any lease extension ends, the tenant will be considered a holdover tenant. The holdover tenant will be required to pay the landlord rent from the time the lease ended to the time the tenant continued to remain in the property. The landlord and prospective tenants are, are indemnified from damages caused by the holdover tenant. Rent for any holdover period will be three times the monthly rent calculated on a daily basis. This is why it is important to vacate the property when the lease ends unless the parties have agreed otherwise. Paragraph 23, Residential Landlord's Lien. This paragraph explains that a landlord is entitled to exercise a lien for unpaid rent against a tenant's non-exempt personal property and may seize this property if the tenant fails to pay the rent. The tenant should review subchapter C, chapter 54 of the Texas Property Code, which governs the rights and obligations of the parties regarding the lien. Consult with an attorney for more information. Paragraph 24, Subordination. This paragraph explains that the rights of the tenant under the lease will be secondary to the rights of any lender whose mortgage affects the property or to the rights of any owner's association affecting the property. Paragraph 25, Casualty Loss or Condemnation. If the property is unusable for residential purposes after a casualty loss, review Section 92.054 of the Texas Property Code for the rights and obligations of the parties regarding a casualty loss to the property. Also, any condemnation of all or a part of the property is considered a casualty loss. In some cases, this means that the tenant may terminate the lease and be eligible for a refund of their security deposit. This paragraph explains that any amounts paid due to a casualty loss will be the landlord's sole property. The tenant should look to their renter's insurance to reimburse or compensate them for any casualty loss of their personal property. Paragraph 26, Special Provisions. This paragraph will contain any sp special provisions that will become part of the lease. Be sure to carefully review any language that is provided in this paragraph. Paragraph 27, Default. This paragraph explains that a party may seek relief provided by law if the other party fails to comply with the lease. Under this paragraph, the tenant will find the remedies the landlord may pursue if the tenant fails to pay rent on time or fails to comply with the provisions in the lease. Most importantly, this paragraph permits the landlord to terminate the tenant's right to occupy the property by providing the tenant with a one-day written notice to vacate if the tenant violates the lease. Pay careful attention to this paragraph as a three-day notice to vacate is not required. Paragraph 28, Early Termination. 
This paragraph discusses early termination rights, assignment, and subletting. The tenant may have special statutory rights to terminate the lease early in certain situations involving military deployment or military transfer, family violence, or certain sex offenses. The tenant early termination rights are limited to these three situations. If the tenant wants to terminate the lease early for any other reason, such as a job transfer or buying a home, they may not assign or sublease the property without the landlord's consent. If the landlord agrees to an assignment, sublease, or replacement, the tenant may be required to pay the amount listed in this paragraph. Paragraph 29, Attorney's Fees. This paragraph explains that a prevailing party in any legal proceeding related to the lease is entitled to recover attorney's fees and court costs from the non-prevailing party. Paragraph 30, Representations. This paragraph provides that the tenant's statements in the lease, any rental application, are material representations. As a party to the lease, the tenant represents that they are of legal age to enter into a contract. Any misrepresentation will place the tenant in default of the lease. Paragraph 31, Addenda. This paragraph will indicate whether any additional documents are part of the agreement between the parties. Any checked items are incorporated into the lease, which may include any rules and regulations of the landlord and an owner's association rules, if any. If any of these items are checked, carefully review them since they become part of the lease. Paragraph 32. Notices. This paragraph notifies the tenant that all notices must be in writing. This paragraph also provides that proper notice is effective when hand-delivered, sent by mail, or sent by electronic transmission to the address, email address, or fax number specified in this paragraph. Be sure to follow up with the other party to make sure notices have been received. Paragraph 33, Agreement of the Parties. This paragraph informs the tenant that this lease contains the entire agreement between the landlord and the tenant. Oral agreements do not become part of the lease. Any changes must be in writing and signed by all parties. Remember, the lease is binding once it is signed by all the parties. Most importantly, if an active realtor member of the Texas Association of Realtors or an active member of the State Bar of Texas does not negotiate the lease as a party for one of the parties, the lease is voidable at will by the tenant. Paragraph 34, Information. This paragraph contains several important information items the tenant should become familiar with. For instance, it reminds the tenant of their responsibility prior to signing the lease to determine whether all services are accessible to or from the property, whether the services are sufficient for the tenant's needs, and whether the tenant is satisfied with the condition of the property. This paragraph informs the tenant that the brokers to the lease do not have any knowledge of whether the landlord is delinquent in the payment of any lien against the property. Any unpaid rent and any unpaid amount under the lease are reportable to credit reporting agencies. Also, this paragraph provides that the landlord is not obligated to respond to any requests for the tenant's rental history until the tenant has given notice of termination of the lease and the tenant is not in breach of the lease. It is recommended that the tenant obtain insurance for casualties such as fire, flood, water damage, and theft because the landlord's insurance will not provide coverage to the tenant for loss of personal property. Finally, this paragraph reminds the tenant to carefully review all provisions prior to signing the lease as it is a binding and enforceable contract. That concludes the presentation on the TAR residential lease. Remember to read through the entire lease before signing and consult with legal counsel if you do not understand the effect of the lease. Thank you.